1827, after Jesus, well known, logged on, using the metaphor of the camel through the needle's eye, and the exclamation of the disciples, who can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Is it possible with God to do what have proved impossible with major thinkers in human history? That is to ascertain the contours of possibility. Uh, this is what we should try to gather now. The very shrewdness, prudence, competence of the wise functions as a trap for them as we find in the book of Job, again, Job 5.13. We have seen that the gifts of brilliant minds have led them into blind delays and sometimes on the brink of the deadly pit. But God has not left us without a witness to his truth, to Torah and testimony, a light on our path. Unfortunately, we find nowhere in scripture an ex professo detail and, and focused treatment of our topic. We have to dig and extract from passages that deal primarily with other topics what is relevant, relevant to our quest. We must explicit what is implicit. And as always, we only do so at at our own risk. The safeguard and sometimes confirmation comes from the analogy of faith. Not only intertextual connections, but also interrelations within the organism of revealed truth. And of course, the pessimistic, pessimistic assessment of the work of the wise represents only one side of the biblical picture. The wise also bring to light elements or aspects of divine truth by the operation of God's common grace, and in some cases of God's special redemptive grace. So not without the help of those we have consulted, in the previous period, we are going to search the scriptures to know if we may speak of possibility and how, if we may and must. I have two parts, two rather large parts. Possibility with God, human possibilities. Very simple division of our topic. The verse I quoted as an epigraph is an echo of Genesis 18:14. The word said uh, when the miraculous conception of Isaac was announced, uh, God is able to do infinitely beyond what is expected on the human side. It is quoted in two other places in scripture in Jeremiah 32 and also again in Luke 1, there is in scripture distinctly a language of possibility for God. So I try to summarize my findings in this respect. The theme is conveyed first by the titles of God. The translation Almighty for Shaddai has been criticized, as you probably know, and I would not insist on the traditional rendering of that title. The question of etymology has not been settled, to my knowledge. The, the old rabbinical interpretation is a pun, she die, who enough, <laughs> meaning the one who do, never lacks resources, the one who has total sufficiency 
in himself the autarchic one, we could say. So we are not so far from the Almighty, although this is not strictly a translation. For those interested, Old Testament people especially, I suppose among you, uh, I may mention something I found uh, in the Old Testament I have not read anywhere, so maybe it is, but I found that the title Shaddai is associated in recurrent fashion with the theme of fertility only in the Pentateuch, not in other books of the Bible which I think deserves some <laughs> reflection. What does it imply in, in the prophets? What predominates is, is a play on word. Shod Shaddai, the devastation of Shaddai from another root, probably. But um, in the Pentateuch, it is the power to generate life uh, in, in, in fields with crops uh, and in cattle and so on. Uh, and also in human families. But if Shaddai is not to be translated almighty, uh, the possession of all power is not taught only by uh, this title or by the dubious translation of that title. There are other titles that imply it uh, without any possible denial. Pantocrator master of all, exercising all power, which is typical of the book of Revelation. It is a biblical title for God. Also, the despotes, which has given despot <laughs> in, in English and in French also, uh, with the root of the word possibility. Uh, it's the uh, in, in the root um, uh, poti uh, in the in Indo-Aryan uh, roots of various European languages, which means master. It is the root for uh, the Latin word posse or posum in the first person singular, uh, and therefore of uh, possibilitas and uh, our, our word possibility. And it is in despotes, a title for God in the New Testament, in, in three passages. So uh, we must say we have a witness. Uh, we have the title Pantocrator also in the Apostles' Creed. This carries some authority uh, with it. And the statement that God can all is also the confession on Job's lips at the end uh, of the story. I recognize that thou canst everything call to hell. <laughs> Nothing is cut off literally from, uh, from you, from thee. The basic biblical formula defining that power seems to be that of Psalm 115. Our God is in heaven. Everything he pleases, he does. All things he wishes, hafet, <laughs> he does. This is the way God's power seems to be uh, understood. It has a relationship with hafet, which can be tra translated uh, both by pleasure and planning. Uh, I think you have both meaning associated in the use of that word. And we find the same formula in a sentence which is slightly different in Psalm 135. Our God um, does, effectuates all that he hafets in heaven and in, on the earth and in the, uh, in the seas and all the abysses. Uh, all regions of reality as they can be uh, imagined. Romans 9.19 also offers a, an interesting uh, statement. Nothing can oppose his will. Mm -hmm. uh, this is oh, his, his decision, Bulema. Uh, this is, uh, uh, again, in, an interesting interpretation of what is God's power in the biblical perspective. And 
uh, we see that many events are ascribed to his power. Nothing can hinder his plan to be uh, uh, carried on. And uh, we have already in creation the relationship between uh, the command, Yahi, and the execution, why Yahi? Let this be, and it was. Uh, this is the mark of that power uh, of God. In, in Genesis 18 and in some other passages, you also have a, an interesting Hebrew verb, the verb, the, the root pala, uh, pela med aleph, uh, which means something extraordinary, something that passes uh, human uh, capabilities. Uh, I think the sense of transcendence is expressed through that root in, in, in the Old Testament. He is a God of niflaut, marvels, <laughs> wondrous things. Uh, this is, again, uh, a way of talking about God's power. This is active power. I think we may say it implies a passive power, which is correlative to it. The language of passive power is being used. Things are possible. And there are things possible that don't happen. This is very important also for our reflection. Francisco Turretin, <laughs> for instance, quotes Matthew 3.9 and Matthew 26.53. John the Baptist says that God could create uh, sons to Abraham from these stones. <laughs> Probably he plays on words, uh, by the way. Uh, stones are vanim, and, and um, uh, sons vanim. <laughs> you see? So, but God does not transform these stones into children of Abraham. So it is a possibility ascribed to God, <laughs> uh, which will not be actualized. And Matthew, 26 is Jesus' word about the legions of angels that he could ask the Father to send. Again, a non-realized possibility. And finally, in this review <coughs> of primary data, <coughs> some things are said to be impossible to God. Habakkuk 1, God has eyes too pure to look upon evil, and the prophet says, thou canst tolerate wrongdoing. You cannot. Thou canst not. Hebrews 6.13 stresses that there are things in which God cannot lie. Speaking of the certainty of the oath that God pronounces. Hebrews 6.13, and of course I already quoted uh, 2 Timothy 2, God cannot deny himself. What should we say on the basis of these uh, references? I think those two things do not happen, and yet are said to be possible, uh, is enough to repel a totally deterministic system such as Spinoza's. There are things that don't happen, therefore, not everything is uh, in an uh, unbroken chain uh, with full determination of everything that happens uh, according to rational necessity. This is ruled out. Spinoza was not the, the only one. Uh, there were men in in ancient Greece, who already thought along those lines, but Spinoza is the best example in, in, in our world of um, Western thought. There is, therefore, a legitimate notion of possibility. Uh, we may be sure of that. We may also uh, add uh, that impossibilities for God, that God cannot do some of the things 
uh, that we just heard, uh, is enough to repel Descartes' idea of God being above the principle of contradiction and all the basic logical, mathematical, and moral truth which he freely determined uh, uh, and which could have been other. If God cannot deny himself, this means there is some precedence uh, of his character, essence, nature, uh, as you may call it. So this already is some safeguard uh, in, in the way we are to, to walk. I suggest that speaking of possibility for God is to affirm a creational relation according to the text we have seen. The barrier against pantheism is the dependence of the universe for its essence and for its existence on God's free willing. Creation establishes a non-symmetrical structure with God's decision or counsel in the center. Scripture insists on the freedom of this decision uh, as the ground of the world's existence. God had no need of creatures. This is a point of Paul in his Areopagus address, Acts 17:25. Paul also insists on God's sovereign freedom in shaping the human body, just as he wished uh, in 1 Corinthians 12:18. And the potter's metaphor illustrates this teaching. Should we therefore suppose many possible worlds, indeed with Leibniz an infinity of them, among which God would have chosen the world that actually uh, exists? I leave aside a of our reflection the strange hypotheses of some contemporary scientists and their multiverse. I I heard, I saw it on TV once. Uh, I think we shouldn't too bother too much about uh, these hypotheses. We may wait for confirmation if it ever comes. <laughs> uh, and even if it comes, uh, I think we can consider philosophically and theologically that these various worlds in the language of those scientists are all components of God's created universe and therefore uh, we shouldn't bother uh, uh, with this question today. But in Leibniz's sense, possible worlds in God's mind. I'm suspicious of the idea uh, at the outset because I don't see in scripture any allusion to such a plurality, an antecedent plurality. Dr. Lydia Jaeger, whom I already mentioned, wisely observes that there is no suggestion that God did not choose between several models in, in, in any passage we have a scripture. Of course, this absence is not, not proof that this cannot be uh, considered, but still it is a warning. We should be extremely uh, careful. Possibility seems always relative to the actual creation of God. And some theological minds have said it quite strongly. C.S. Lewis, no theologian, of course, no great authority among philosophers and theologians, but yet an extraordinary sensitive thinker <laughs> and with a remarkable culture introduced the idea that this world, perhaps, he said perhaps, was the only possible one. You find this in the, pro in the problem of pain. And in this house, Carl F. Henry. <laughs> Carl F. Henry, in the sixth volume of God, Revelation, and Authority, could write, I quote, if God is immutable, moreover, if his mind or decree fixed the details of world history, including the decree to create, 
is not the actual universe also the only possible one? I confess I was surprised because this is not so traditional. <laughs> this idea that the actual world is the only possible one, but that such a theologian as Carl F. Henry should have suggested the thing is interesting. Again, it is a warning. It shows us that we shouldn't accept too easily uh, the idea of a large number, maybe an infinity, uh, of possible worlds. I confess that when people speak of possible worlds, as if, as if they could play with them as with balls. I remember how Kant showed in his critique of pure reason the difficulty of thinking just of our world. <laughs> How we fall in, in, into antinomies, uh, antinomies of pure reason. Uh, so we do not dispose so easily of the thought of a, a world. But regarding Leibniz's hypothesis, especially, the presence of worlds before God makes the decision to create them, and as part of the divine essence itself, does it not undermine the distinction between creator and creature? If the world, of course, has possibilities, but yet, independently of God's will, are already part of God, in God, well, well, are we not very near to the pantheistic heresy, which Leibniz wanted to avoid, but, but, but. And if we say they are not those possibilities within God, but then they become a kind of partner, especially since with Leibniz we have seen it, these possible worlds are already loaded with the weight of reality. They vibe with each other. They tend in proportion of their goodness to existence. Therefore, if they are understood as outside of God, then God has a partner. We fall into dualism or polytheism. Uh, by the way, uh, Spinoza had, had spotted that danger. <laughs> you see, sometimes those enemies of the faith do help us to fight other errors. <laughs> he saw it uh, as a difficulty. So, uh, as a correlate of God's power, we may speak of the logical possibility uh, uh, of worlds existing, and we don't know uh, what this means precisely, uh, but without loading them with any weight of reality. And we observe that scripture itself speaks of possibility in relation with the world. Lydia Yeager speaks of a layer of possibility, a kind of aura of possibility uh, around the world. God could have done things otherwise, but this is still relative to the world he decided to create. Another problem with Leibniz's presentation is the role of non-contradiction. All these possible worlds are only defined by the principle of non-contradiction. If you have no contradiction, then it exists as a possibility in the mind of God. This elevates this principle of non-contradiction to the status of maybe an, of an ultimate principle of God. At least the fear that it should be so may be awakened. Again, I say the principle of non-contradiction uh, we may and even we ought to receive. Mm. Uh, this is what uh, I draw from the, the fact that God cannot deny himself. Also, I didn't mention that the other day, uh, from the language of yes and no. Contradiction is yes and no together, but precisely Jesus rules out this joining of yes and no uh, at the same time on the same point. Your yes be yes, your no be no. And 
in first Cor in second Corinthians chapter one, uh, Paul says the word of, of Christ had not been yes and no <laughs> at the same time. See? Uh, what is interesting is that Engels, Friedrich Engels, Karma's companion, had seen that and protested. He had seen that this rules out the dialectics <laughs> of yes and no. See? It has import for philosophy and, and theology. So uh, we are to accept the principle of non-contradiction. But as I said, in order to apply it, we need <laughs> the framework of God's revelation. We need to be told by God what this actually implies. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I think Leibniz trespassed <laughs> uh, over the limits of a proper uh, obedient thinking in faith. Uh, he, he tried to, to respect Holy Scripture. He, he quotes it always as an authority. But I think he overstepped uh, the limits at this, at this place. This is what we may say uh, uh, in, by way of criticism uh, of a kind of hypothesization uh, of passive possibility uh, in regard uh, to uh, God's relationship with possibility. But if we pause to meditate on his active power, I cannot deny, however, that serious dif difficulties beset our faith in its quest for intelligence. And this, I must, in all openness, <laughs> also set forth before you. When we, when we say that somebody acts, we usually think of a transition from planning to actual occurrence. Hafez and then Asa uh, doing. Uh, this state of affairs did not exist. I think of it, I dream of it, I intend to do it, I act, and here it is. I bring it into existence. This is the scheme, I think common sense will uh, grant it, uh, the scheme of our understanding of action and, and, and power. And I think that such seems to be the notion in the Bible. Uh, also with creation, with such phrases as before the foundation of the world. Now, the difficulty. How can this happen if God is actus porus, pure act, as theolog theologian, in evangelical theologian also, have usually maintained in Aristotle's sense? Nothing virtual or potential. Act in that connection does not mean being active at all, <laughs> rather the contrary, you see. It is the perfection uh, of full re realization. As I, I stressed, uh, Aristotle's God moved everything without even knowing it. <laughs> How far from the biblical God? So you see the difficulty there? What underlies the denial of all potentiality in God is one of the factors, is the common view of eternity. Theology has accepted that eternity is pure present, motionless, without any succession of moments, without any before or after. For God, we are told there is neither past nor future, everything purely present. This is the Platonic view, which has been transmitted especially to Boethius at the end uh, of antiquity. Well, if this is so, what is left for power, active power? Can the word still be meaningful? May we ascribe acts to the eternal one if his eternity is so conceived. 
How could we distinguish between Hafez and Asa <laughs> in such an eternity of pure now, without a succession? You see the difficulty at this, at this point. Another aspect, ultimately probably the same difficulty, but if God, the Exodus I am, eh, ipsum esse in Latin, being itself in English, who is the fullness of all reality, if God has such a fullness, how can there be other beings distinct from himself? Everything creatures have belonged to God. They have it in him, as Acts 17 uh, uh, confirms. Dualism is ruled out, of course, for, for Christians and also for Jews and Muslims. But if we accept the denial of all dualism, God is the only existing one to start with. And no other principle at all, how can there be any being distinct from him? Spinoza looks more consistent. He says there is only one substance, God, and all other beings, bracket, are only modes of his substance. Though Spinoza does not account for the distinction and multiplication uh, of modes. Are we not very near the Maya of Hindu philosophy and religion? You see the difficulty. Akin to this difficulty, but a little more technical, is the dilemma Jürgen Moltmann frankly faces. He says, what of the value and weight of reality of the world for God? We seem to be caught again in a dilemma. One horn of the dilemma. If we say that creation was perfectly free, that God had no need whatsoever of others, if there can be others, while creation appears as a gratuitous exercise, just a bit of fun with little import. All finite being equals zero in front of the infinite. So how can humankind and the world count for God? That's one horn. The other horn, if we say that the world counts, that God involves himself when he creates, that he invests what he is, then we jeopardize the total freedom of creation. Maltman definitely prefers to say so, uh, it is in his book, God in Creation. He definitely favors, and he says, panentheism, which is half pantheism. He, he assumed that. Uh, he says, we should rehabilitate the category of emanation. And the most clever move, he appeals to the reformed divines of the 17th century. He had studied them for his dissertation as a, as a young man. And he notes that for them, since God is actus purus, actus purissimus, the, the Aristotelian theme, they denied a real distinction between God's essence and God's decree. Yeah, he has quotations. It is. They said there is no real distinction. It is just a distinction of reason, which we make when we think of it. <clears throat> the decree includes the world and the whole history of the world. If there is no real difference between God's decree and God's essence, is not, again, the distinction between God and world seriously undermined. You see the difficulty? We have to confess, very often we ignore the problem because we travel by an anthropomorphic reduction of God. 
we say God is infinite, but actually we imagine him uh, downsized to our measure, just a little bigger. But how should we responsibly deal with the difficulty? I will suggest that the anthropomorphic model does still yield precious truths, but it may set us on the, on the wrong track. So uh, I first say which solutions are not true solutions in my proposal. We cannot sacrifice the greatness of the biblical God. High and lifted up, Pantocrator, from whom, through whom, for whom are all things, who has all fullness and sovereign authority. This is the biblical God Almighty. This I borrow from Tillich, although our theologists differ toto coelo entirely. Finite gods are transcended by the God who is being itself. Enough of petty gods who can be popular, even in churches, as they were in heathen piety. I like the cry that we hear, we heard it on TV, Allahu Akbar. Allah is not the Muslim name for God, it's the Arabic word for God. <laughs> and it is the cousin of the Hebrew word for God. So we may appropriate the word Allah. And saying Allah is greater, it, I'm told it is the translation of Allahu Akbar. I think we can and must say it too, and we cannot sacrifice that greatness. We cannot compromise God's freedom as Maltman does. Although he tries to remain moderate, I, I do recognize this, he starts sliding on the slope that leads to pantheism, and pantheism is idolatry. So uh, I cannot follow Maltman. In that book, because Maltman changed gears very often in his career. So we cannot describe to uh, the whole of his career what he said at one specific moment. I suggest that we should also flee, uh, that we should not flee to apophatic theology, negative theology, which says that we can only uh, ultimately remain silent. This is not even the via negativa uh, in the recognition of God's uh, perfections. Negative theology is learned ignorance, docta ignorantia. <laughs> uh, uh, Non-knowledge, but which is beyond knowledge and uh, uh, reaches into uh, ultimate silence. Contrary to what is very commonly heard, I say this is no protection against idolatry. On the contrary, the negative element is part of idolatry. If we study idolatry, for idol worshippers, the idol is the God and is not the God. They are conscious of that duality and ambiguity of the representation of their gods. So the negative moment belongs to idolatry itself. It is not a sure protection against it. The only sure, sure protection is found in a verse which, to me, is most opposed to the uh, apophatic uh, praise and, as it were, mystic drunkenness. <laughs> it is first John. 520. We have been given the dianoia, the discursive thought, in order to know the true one and his son Jesus Christ. He is Jesus Christ, the true one, <laughs> God. And therefore, beware of idols the last word in, in the epistle. This is the sure protection against idolatry, receiving the dianoia uh, of the apostolic teaching, 
of our Lord's word as brought to us by his faithful and inspired witnesses. This is the sure protection. All these are four solutions. Is there a, a, a true solution? What shall we do and say? I have no recipe. But I dare say that the divine simplicity, I would not discard the term, is no simple matter. We see things through a mirror. The apostle says, the mirror of God's works with his comments added. But this still means we see things indirectly. We see them, he says, in enigma. And I enigma thing. It doesn't say in obscure fashion. This is not the right translation of the text. Uh, indirectly, through a mirror, and with enigmas that remain. It means mystery. It doesn't mean mastery for our knowledge. Mastery, no. Mystery, yes. And I make three points. I suggest that we are not to start with the notion of being with the infinite, finite pair of concepts, but with creation as the concrete structure which defines our place. And we cannot go higher and beyond. It is constitutive for us. In the beginning, God created. This asymmetrical structure is the foundation of everything we are, we do, and say. Second remark, I have criticized elsewhere the idea of eternity as pure present. I don't think it is taught in scripture. But we should not in my opinion at least, erase all distinction between creature and time and divine eternity. I receive the biblical proclamation of God's immutability. I suggest that as the mystery of the Trinity enables us to maintain both the one and the many, though we don't master it. Similarly, the, ministry, the, the mystery of God's eternal life embraces both the unity of divine life, which is higher than any uh, low degree unity that may found in creatures, the perfect unity of divine life, and the distinction of before and after, of project and realization of Hafez and Asa. And in this, I suggest the anthropomorphic picture of God in many parts of scripture should not be despised or discarded. Of course, we don't take it literally, but we know we think and speak analogically of God under the control of scripture. And this is the only way open to us. Third, third remark. The ability of the God of all fullness to raise others who really count for him. Mortman's problem. Who hold enough substantiality to be his vis-a-vis -vis partners. This is the mystery of creation. Precisely God's power to create. This does not fit our ordinary logic because it's, it, it's God's own power, the power of God, who is able to raise other beings than himself, independent of himself, and yet distinct from himself. Probably there is in his trinity, in his trinitarian character, the ground for that. But it is beyond everything we conceive on the basis of what we observe in creation, far beyond. God shows himself greater than what we conceive, what we dream, 
who Allah, <laughs> our God, <laughs> is greater. So this is what I suggest about possibility and God. And now on human possibilities. As God's images, partners invited into his fellowship, humans, creatures function analogically after him. And so they have received active power, just as God uses active power in God's dependence, they are able also. They desire and will, they have hafets. <laughs> they have the ability to carry through their plans. They do and act as they please. But the power is limited. Humans, and this is a contrast with God, cannot do all what they wish. And this is clear in the statement of Jesus with which we started. These think is impossible to men. <laughs> well, that means that there are things possible and things impossible. That there are true powers granted humankind, but also limits to these powers, to these possibilities. And since this power is received, is uh, continually dependent, it includes passive dimensions we, which are not found uh, in, in God. Possibilities with human agents are also possibilities uh, with them as patients uh, with passive rules. They are able to be changed, to undergo, to resist or receive transformation. The basis and background of this proposition is part of the doctrine of creation. God has endowed his creatures with persistent features, including active and passive properties. We could say abilities or possibilities. He has created them with natures, other words, have been used, essence, quiditas, quartness, uh, as near synonyms of nature. Uh, nature characterizes among living creatures specific collection of individuals, what is common to them, and what is transmitted and reproduced through generation. This is why the word nature comes in Latin from uh, the word to be born. The participle born is natus, and you get from it natura. See? The affirmation of natures has not been popular in late modern philosophy. Sartre is known as an arch enemy with the celebrated statement that existence precedes essence. And essence is determined by that unbound freedom which enjoys pure possibility. Each individual decides about its, his own essence. The tag essentialist is hard to bear nowadays. You probably know it. I do feel that sc the scholastic masters tended to grant excessive value to natures to eclipse their total dependence on God's plan and workings, to minimize the plasticity of created natures. But the New Testament endorses the notion, whether the New Testament uses the word physis, he does in several places, or not. Without the word also, you have no, the notion, as for instance at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul deals with the various natures of uh, living uh, creatures and with of stars and so on. So I think we ought to accept the idea, idea of nations with more flexibility than the scholastics have shown. On this basis, I suggest that we are warranted in speaking of real possibilities on the basis of the properties given to uh, creatures, and we are thinking especially of humans. Uh, there are 
possibilities which have a reality already. <laughs> uh, there are traits that exist already, that may be described, that stand in intelligible continuity with the actual occurrence. It's not necessarily a causal relationship, but it is a continuity that our intelligence may appreciate. And I call this, in contrast with abstract, purely logical possibility, real possibility. I think this may be said uh, on the basis of, of scripture. And then I introduce a further category, the dose of reality associated with possibility may vary, it seems to me. And, that, and I therefore propose that we coin a specific name for the highest degree possibility, possibility, real possibility of certain occurrence. This is still possibility, not necessity, because the element considered is not enough to cause the event. So there is no straightforward continuity uh, and uh, relationship of entailment. At the same time, attendant circumstances may combine with that real possibility to produce a certainty of occurrence. So I suggest this may be a helpful category for us. So I arrive at a summary of what I think I found, <laughs> a summary of findings, uh, speaking both of possibility in relationship with God and with God's images, human creatures. Possibility for God prior to the decree remains shrouded in mystery. I consider it wiser not to try to speculate on this topic. Relatively to the actual world of God's creation, we may accept the purely logical category of the possible. It was possible before God created it. Yes, we may say so in the sense that it was not impossible, but I don't think we have said much when we have said this. Only we express that God was free in his act of creation. Second, possibilities implied by the powers of human nature, active and passive powers, are real. But they are not absolute. And in this, I resist even Kierkegaard's uh, teaching and testimony. I do so with trembling. <laughs> I revere Kierkegaard, and I find it very difficult to uh, oppose him. But when he said that freedom is infinite, uh, that uh, there is infinite possibility educating us, no, this does not conform to scriptural teaching. The spectrum of active and passive possibilities is limited. It is not abysmal. Though I don't deny that there is a sense in which human inwardness is related to infinity. Uh, yes. We are made for God, and we transcend the world towards God. But this consideration does not entail that we can call our freedom infinite. Third, human possibilities, such possibilities I just described, are entirely subsumed in the all-embracing project of God. God operates all things according to the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1.11. They never escape the framework of God's plan whereby he, he foreordained whatever comes to pass. I think scripture testifies massively to this truth, whether in all-encompassing statements or in, or in particular illustrations such as the fall of the sparrow, the treachery of Joseph brothers, and so on. And if we consider this plan of God, and ask about possibility in an absolute way, then we say that something which is not in God's plan cannot 
ever happen. So there is no possibility at all uh, from that point of view. But, fourth point, uh, we may ask if the human possibility is so surrounded, comprehended by God's plan, still deserves the name of possibilities. And I will answer, yes, they do. The emphasis on self-determination, the play of motives that lead to inclination, uh, as in Leibniz's analysis, which is very often the argument of compatibilists, as they are called, I think is not devoid of relevance. And yet, I'm persuaded that this is not the deeper word we need in this connection. What preserves created freedom? What makes human possibility, true possibility, significant possibility before God, is the unique relationship of human inwardness to God. God is no external force as all other forces, creative forces, are. Even, even psychological forces are external to the secrecy of the I uh, of the, the person. But God is not. God is no external force. His transcendent reaches to uh, the root of selfhood. And this Augustine said, in words that are very precious to my heart, more interior than the most interior part of myself. God is more interior uh, than myself to myself. <laughs> and as such, he is the root and guarantor uh, of the truth of the freedom he has granted me. It is the same mystery as the divine ability to raise a true vis-a-vis -vis partner, true sons and daughters, with him. Thus, this analysis illuminates the difficulty I mentioned in the first lecture. Just try to apply it briefly. Was it possible for Christ to yield to a temptation? Considering his divine nature, we must say, real impossibility. <laughs> Considering the divine foreordination of all events, we must say, real impossibility. But, considering his human nature, which though sin has bore the consequences of sin, weakness. 2 Corinthians 13.4 ascribes weakness to Jesus Christ. He was crucified because of weakness. In the solidarity of sinful rights, although without sin, considering his human nature as it was, I think we can say there was a real possibility of his sinning. It is a separate consideration at its own level, but the analysis is legitimate. And so we can draw comfort from the knowledge that he was tempted as we are. You see how distinguishing levels and kinds of possibility may help us to deal with this problem I, I had mentioned to start with. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>